Okay. So um, all that will make sense <laughs> when we start. But uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, I'm uh, actually um, uh, joining you from the uh, traditional unceded ancestral territory of Musqueam um, out at UBC campus. And so uh, that each of you, um, wherever you are joining from, will uh, take a moment to, uh, uh, to think of where uh, you, you are and whose uh, territory you're on. Um, I think it's also an appropriate way to actually open this up because a lot of what we're you know, going to be talking about today is, is the past. And uh, I'm going to start uh, with, with a little bit of a background to um, an exhibit that is on my two, uh, two sites, uh, the Museum of Vancouver and then also the Hansing Athletic Club, which is in Vancouver, Chinatown. And, uh, and it's called A Seat at the Table. And I'll talk a little bit about where that name came from and why we think it's a, a, a resonant name for the themes that it addresses. Um, so actually, yeah, where, where would the slideshow be? Who's, who's going to kick it on? Is it, do you want me to do it or uh, Denise? Just uh, logistically? Uh, Nabila, would you mind sharing your screen yeah, maybe um, for the slides? Yeah. And I'll, I'll sort of say when to get to the next slide or the next slide. Thanks. Um, so just a little background. Uh, the, the, the title of our talk today is Belonging at the Table, and that's a play off of the, the title of the exhibit on right now, A Seat at the Table. Um, and, the, and the reason why is because that, you know, this is, uh, you're you're having lunch and you're you're think you're at maybe some table or desk or uh, if you're at work maybe some of you are eating out of a uh, a microwave container um, but wherever you're at the the metaphor of a table was for us really resonant because it means both you know sharing food dining together and really the the um, the way in which Chinese Canadian history has been such an integral part of British Columbia history um, because of the ubiquitous nature of Chinese uh, Canadian cafes and small towns uh, right across Canada all the way through to small towns in the Maritimes, um, but also, you know, Chinese restaurants in places like Vancouver, Chinatown, Victoria, Chinatown, in Nanaimo, and in, in, in small, again, small cities across uh, the country. And, and, the, and why I use that distinction is because, you know, cafes are often a place that are they're called Chinese cafes, cafes because they were run by someone who's Chinese Canadian, but the food itself would wouldn't be Chinese. You know, if you were in a you know a small uh, town, uh, if you were in Terrace or something like that, there might be a Chinese run restaurant, but to, or Nelson, but they would serve you know um, actually Western fare. Uh, whereas in larger cities and in and and small cities as well, you you might have Chinese restaurants that serve Chinese food, and so. These, were, these became often community centers for, uh, for small towns. The people would gather at these places. They were very open and inclusive um, sites. And I think that's what we were trying to capture um, in terms of a forgotten history of you know, Chinese Canadians and others uh, who were excluded, Asians, Trans-Pacific Asian migrants to, to these shores, uh, but also indigenous peoples who, in a uh, white supremacist history, and I use that term very pointedly, um, those histories have often been forgotten, even though they were very central to the experience of life in a place like British Columbia. So um, belonging at the table is in some ways about, you know, a seat at the table and belonging. And that's that other sense of a seat at the table, which is to struggle for a seat at the table, to, to, to have to fight because of exclusion and discrimination and racism for a place you know, in society. And so um, maybe I'll, you know, you can flip to the next slide. Um, and that uh, initial image, just so you know, is from the Museum of Vancouver exhibit. Um, and it's an evocative image because it shows a lot of the explicit anti-Chinese um, texts, uh, legislation, a long history. And uh, that is a good segue. The province of British Columbia apologized for its long history uh, right from its first moments as a province, when the first acts in 1871 was to pass a, uh, uh, a, a law that uh, denied Chinese and other non-whites the vote. 
um, Chinese could vote in the colony of British Columbia, uh, but they were the vote was taken away as the first act of the provincial legislature upon entering the Dominion of Canada. The city of Vancouver, after its founding in 1885, in a very similar way, immediately began to disenfranchise and take away rights of uh, Chinese uh, in Vancouver. Um, so there was an apology in 2018, four years after the provincial apology. So what are we apologizing for? Well, a long history of both legislative, but also um, regulatory racism. So it wasn't just that there were laws against the Chinese, there were also regulatory, hygiene, health, business licenses. Um, and so this uh, picture is actually of the official apology, and that's Mayor Gregor Robertson at the time of the city of Vancouver and all of the city council of Vancouver. And the apology is taking place not in the city council chambers, but actually in Chinatown. And that was something, there was a committee, a historical discrimination against Chinese people's committee that was set up in 2015, so three years earlier, that it researched and examined the history of um, anti-Chinese discrimination in Vancouver. And, you know, we wanted to know what we were apologizing for. And then the question of why is, are apologies useful? Are they backward looking? Some people argue that, oh, we shouldn't be dwelling in the past, but is that what an apology actually is? What does an apology in the present have to do with the past? And one of the reasons why we actually had the apology take place in Chinatown, and you can see um, Maggie uh, Yip and Bill Yi. Bill Yi a, was the first Chinese Canadian city councillor in uh, Vancouver history. Uh, Maggie Yip was also a former city councillor. They were reading out the apology in Cantonese and in Siyup di dialect, the, the actual sort of village dialects of many of the early Chinese migrants. Um, and the reason why we did it in Chinatown is precisely the symbolic act of going to apologize where the symbolic center of Chinese Canadian community life was, which is Chinatown. Rather than say, we're going to say, sorry, you have to come to the city council to receive the apology. And in fact, the city council chambers were quite small and they couldn't have accommodated it, uh, very many people. So doing it in Chinatown meant that there could be a almost 500 people in the Chinese cultural center and, you know, witnessing it in person as well as on large TV screens in the streets of Chinatown, another several hundred, almost a thousand people outside. And so it became a very public apology. I could put it uh, on Next Twitter. slide, please. Thanks, Nabil. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, you can see in the photo of the audience that there were many Chinese Canadian elders, uh, some of them downloaded and were again. old enough to have experienced some of that legislated racism. That, in fact, you know, the first uh, the first moment uh, after Confederation from 1871 until 1947 was the first moment the Chinese were allowed to vote. So there were people who actually were alive in 1947. Some, in fact, there was military veterans from World War II now in their 90s. Um, who actually had gone to war for Canada, even though they had no legal rights to vote. They could not, you know, uh, they could not be in professions because many of the professions, like being a doctor, engineer, or a lawyer, required you to have the vote in order to be a member of that licensed member of that professional association. So uh, Chinese Canadians, like many non-whites, could not vote and therefore could not be professionals, uh, could not argue cases at court. So in having the witnesses to the apology, there was a specific set of people who were being apologized to, both symbolically as well as in practice. Um, and that's why we were in Chinatown. Um, next, please. Next slide. Thanks. So I mentioned white supremacy, and uh, that may be a phrase that uh, some of you may kind of go, ooh, that's, is, that's like Nazis, isn't it? Or, or that's what's going on in the States right now with, uh, with the Proud Boys. Or, well, we had that here too. You know, there were political slogans like uh, a white man's province you know, that were winning political slogans. You know, people who became premier used that slogan in their campaigns. Or White Canada Forever was a, was a popular, actually, parlor, beer parlor song. You know, one of the more popular, you know, sheet musics 
uh, being bought in, in the early 1900s. Um, so that became a part of everyday life and the mundane nature of white supremacy. So you can see this is an advertisement, home cooking white help only. In other words, if you eat here, there'll be no Chinese cooking the food for you, or there will be a, only white help. Um, next, please. One of the things about, you know, the question of what you're apologizing for, as I mentioned, you know, I'm not going to read this out, but you can, again, it's written down here. You can, you, you know, we're happy to send you the PowerPoint slide if, if you'd like the copy of it, or you can perhaps post it up by uh, uh, to download um, from the from the website uh, for the talk. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is how it was that voting was tied, as I mentioned, to all kinds of of, of other rights. So um, the right to preemption, in other words, taking land from indigenous peoples and then giving it away to new immigrants. Well, those new immigrants had to be from Europe or Britain. And it wasn't given to other people, people from South Asia, from India, from China, from Japan. They weren't given preempted land. So it's almost like you could say maybe that's not a bad thing. You know, if you if you were a Chinese Canadian, you you weren't tainted with the idea of getting fenced stolen goods, of having things taken from indigenous people and given to you. Uh, this the shared um, uh, discrimination you could say of non-white people under white supremacy was that you you actually had a shared struggle. You know? Indigenous peoples, uh, if you were a, a quote status Indian, you, you could not vote until 1960. So another 13 years after Chinese Canadians and, and South Asian people uh, uh, were uh, granted the, the franchise. Uh, next, please. So one of the things that really was shaping was actually exclusion. So if you think about people from India, they could come. And then in 1908, the Continuous Journey Act was passed, and there was a testing of that with the, with the Komagata Maru incident in 1914. It's very famous that people uh, know. The Panama Maru was also the year before testing of it uh, with a ship that landed in Victoria and was allowed to land, actually. Um, but what I think is it's one of the things for us to think about in terms of history of exclusion is why does it seem like non-white immigrants are latecomers? Well, one of the reasons is because from 1908 through 1968, if you were from India, you weren't allowed here. And so there's these missing migrants. And so the idea that you don't belong here is still ingrained in a sense of who belongs. And I think that's that sense of who is, when you close your eyes, and who's a normal Canadian, and what do they look like, and who's a newcomer? Well, that's actually the direct result of white supremacy of actually decades through much of our history of excluding non-whites. Therefore, when you finally say, oh, we're going to stop being white supremacist and let people in, you go, well, these people are coming late. They don't belong. It's a manufactured story of belonging and not belonging. So if you begin to think, well, yeah, we really don't deserve to be here yet. We've got to earn our way. That is a result of decades and decades of fully two thirds of our history built around white supremacy in our immigration policy. The point system in 1968, for the first time in Canadian history, evaluated people not on the basis of race to let them in. Just think about that for a second. I was born in 1967 in Vancouver. It's only been in my lifetime that we've let non-white people in without judging them by their race. So we had a lot of historical advisors on that committee. Um, and so this is not being made up. This is this our history. And part of why an apology is not backwards looking is that you cannot move forward until you acknowledge the shared past that you have together. And one of the problems in Canada and one of the results actually of white supremacy is our history has narratively excluded people. So literally we have ignored or forgotten or suppressed stories of non-white in British Columbia history. And so that process of recovery is crucial. 
Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we've forgotten is how mundane and ubiquitous anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism was. That in fact, it was in contracts, in regulations, that if you wanted a contract with the city of Vancouver, you could not be a Chinese Canadian company. But not only that, you could not hire Chinese. So in contracts, we imposed racial discrimination. There were parts of the city that had housing covenants, where if you bought a house, there was an actual legal clause that said you could not sell to a non-white. British properties had these clauses. If you buy a property in British, British properties right now, and you look at the land title, because it's an original land title from the you know, early 20th century, you will see a housing covenant. It's not legally enforceable anymore. It was, that was made moot by regulations in the, the 1960s. The first time it was illegal in British Columbia to discriminate in terms of renting or housing or jobs was in the 1960s. Provincial regulations made those housing covenants and it made it illegal for the first time. Again, two thirds of the way into our history, it was finally made illegal to discriminate in a job or in housing based on race. We have other mundane things like there used to be uh, fresh produce. Chinese farmed up and down the Fraser River. They farmed and they brought fresh produce in these local 100 kilometer diets. You know, they, they actually had peddlers that would bring fresh vegetables door to door. They were made illegal by denying them business licenses. Within one year, they were all gone. So literally, there were attempts to destroy businesses. Next slide, please. So here's an example, just a mundane one. It's a, it's a, it's it's some uh, people uh, who were anti-Chinese and 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 wanted a white man's province. And so this is a poster talking about, you know, sugar, the sugar industry, BC sugar, you know, that it should only be refined by white labor, not by Chinese. And in fact. You know, a bylaw was passed that basically Rogers and BC Sugar at that time was BC Sugar, Rogers Sugar, they could not get a contract with the city unless they agreed contractually not to hire Chinese laborers. So the people who made this poster won. Next slide, please. So what is uh, actually uh, we can rip through this again if you want to go through some of the details. Uh, just an in interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll kind of move on. But just as a point to one thing, which is um, just basically every day uh, segregation physically and uh, geographically and temporally. So uh, physical segregation. If you want to go see a movie in the 1930s, if you were non-white, you would see it from an angle up above because you were only allowed in an alley. So just like the American South, we actually had racial segregation of public spaces like movie theaters. We also had a temporal segregation. If you wanted to go swimming, there were days that were whites only swimmers. And if you were non-white, you had to swim at the public pool on a day where only non-whites, or only that day would non-whites be allowed to swim. So that's a form of segregation that's, that's a kind of, which days are okay for you? A temporal segregation rather than a like the movie theaters of physical or geographic segregation. Next, please. So are there legacies of this history? Is it all gone? We stopped being racist. It's OK. Well, that was then. This is now. Well, uh, there's a I've listed a few things here. We have some readings, too, if you want to read up about legacies and why it's important. Um, and uh, uh, something I call the parable of the textbook about you know collective responsibility for the past. Uh, uh, another example is like thinking about shareholder uh, metaphors. But why don't we just go straight to um, is racism gone? Well, unfortunately, as as many of you know, over the last year because of COVID, there was a very quick rise of anti-Asian violence, anti-Asian assaults. Uh, verbal assaults, also physical assaults. You you may have 
you may remember the horrific image of an elderly Chinese man being shoved to the ground violently by someone um, and called racist names. So it's not gone. The quick nature of blaming Asians for housing unaffordability, blaming Asians for bad driving, blaming Asians for COVID, for disease, blaming Asians for anything that seems to be a problem, that is a direct legacy and result of that long history of white supremacy. So even though we've removed or made moot explicit anti-Asian laws, anti-Chinese laws, it's not legal anymore to be racist, you could say. The full power of the state is not arrayed in the fence of white supremacy. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any legacies anymore. I mentioned one with this idea of belonging, of who this province is for. Is it for indigenous peoples who were here long before and who's on whose land we are on? So I think one of the things about belonging, and this is where maybe go to the next slide. One of the reasons why it was so important to us to as educators to to think about, um, you know, how do we tell a story of the past so that we can create a more uh, a, a stronger sense of of who we are now and going into the future to repudiate that history of exclusion to create a sense of belonging. And uh, one of the things that the seat of the table is the first exhibit, inaugural exhibit of the Chinese Canadian Museum, a, pro a promise of the province of British Columbia and Premier Horgan um, that was fulfilled uh, last year. The new Chinese Canadian Museum was, was um, established. Uh, there's also a promise and we hope that very soon there will be a South Asian Canadian history and community museum. Um, doesn't have to be the same as the one you know, you can, uh, there's going to be consultations for that too. But we think that that's a way of thinking about the past as a part of our present and future. Not to be backward looking, but to be forward looking and how our children understand both and re recognize, acknowledge that history, that dark history, but also how we move forward together. Um, so we can switch to the next one. Um, and then maybe as, as uh, Denise explains the themes and, and how it works, but I'll pass it on. Very, very, very lucky that we had a co three co-curators, Vivian Gosselin of the Museum of Vancouver, the curator uh, of exhibitions, uh, but also uh, Denise Fong, who I've worked with for 10 years and is a wonderful um, uh, historian and researcher and, and uh, curator. And so she curated a, uh, an exhibit at the uh, Burnaby Village Museum called Across the Pacific. Uh, co-curator with Lisa Codd of, of the city of Burnaby, um, but she was so uh, the uh, the co-curator of this uh, exhibit. So I'll pass it on to her to explain the exhibit. Denise. Thank you, Henry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge that I'm right now on the um, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, today, I'm going to share a bit about the A Seat at the Table exhibition. Uh, as Henry has mentioned, there are two locations, uh, one located in Vancouver, Chinatown, and one at the Museum of Vancouver. Um, what's really unique about the Chinatown location uh, is that it's actually located inside a, a heritage building that is actually um, a combination of living quarters, um, a uh, athletic club um, that's part of the um, one of the intangible heritage aspects of Chinatown, which is having these social um, groups that have formed uh, over the years to support the um, social activities of Chinatown residents and all Canadians. Um, and it also was the former location of uh, one of the um, longtime businesses uh, in Chinatown that had um, supplied uh, tailoring businesses um, to customers both in Chinatown but also across Canada. Um, so it's really exciting to be um, having this uh, particular location in Chinatown as it's in situ in the community and it's also um, free admission. So we've um, been fortunate enough that in the past few months um, even with the 
um, situation of the pandemic that we've had over 3,000 visitors come in uh, through the doors uh, since the month of August uh, 2020. So uh, we're incredibly happy that a lot of the visitors uh, were able to uh, come down to Chinatown. A lot of the visitors that came through um, were previously residents uh, of Chinatown, or uh, we even had a family that visited that used to live in this building. So uh, very excited to hear that um, different visitors are finding ways to uh, make their way down and also um, share some of their stories and memories of Chinatown through um, the Hansing uh, Vancouver Chinatown location. And for the Museum of Vancouver location, uh, it's a much larger space, which enables us to really provide a much broader uh, historical context regarding um, many of the themes that uh, Professor Yu had just shared regarding uh, anti-Chinese racism and discrimination and exclusion. Um, but as well um, with the Museum of Vancouver location, there are uh, a number of artistic installations as well as digital media installations um, that make it uh, a really great companion to the Vancouver Chinatown location. Uh, and so if you um, look at the photos on the right side, the top uh, photo is uh, in one of the uh, exhibition spaces within the um, a seat at the table MOV location. And then the photo below is from our Chinatown location. And um, the components of both of these exhibitions uh, will form a traveling exhibition uh, that will be transported to different museums and institutions um, starting in 2022. And we hope that um, the content um, that will be presented uh, in these um, traveling exhibition components will also be adapted to local content. Um, as we know with uh, many different uh, regional uh, smaller museums as well. They have um, their own collections of Chinese Canadian uh, oral histories, photographs and stories and also um, belongings. And so we hope that uh, these local uh, stories and representations can be integrated as part of this uh, traveling exhibition component. And as Henry has also uh, mentioned uh, regarding the relationship with the Chinese Canadian Museum, um, they do have a, a broader mandate to build a hubs and spokes model. And, and so for this entire exhibition, what's been really exciting is to be able to uh, go beyond the story of Vancouver Chinatown and really adopt a really BC-wide geographical focus um, for articulating um, the experiences of Chinese immigration and Chinese Canadian uh, experiences. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I think one of the ways that we wanna highlight um, the uniqueness of this exhibition is the curation process. And one of the things that we wanna emphasize is that um, in, in many cases, um, you know, we work with uh, the community advisory that was formed uh, in the uh, very early stages of this exhibition planning, which started in um, 2018. And so with our community advisory, we had a number of representatives from um, academic communities. Uh, we have researchers from universities like Dr. Imogene Lim uh, from Vancouver Island University. We have uh, Professor Tina Liu from UBC History. Uh, we have a number of community uh, researchers like um, uh, John Atkin, uh, civic historian, uh, Catherine Clement, who recently uh, published the uh, Yu Cho Chao um, volume uh, about his photo collection and the exhibition. Uh, and we have a number of representatives as well from um, different departments and museums um, participating on our advisory board, uh, including representatives from Royal BC Museum uh, and uh, Nanaimo and Cumberland, uh, who are really instrumental in helping to shape um, the content uh, of this exhibition. And uh, part of the um, you know, process was to come up with the idea of what would the central theme be? And so it was really the inspiration of the community advisory that the idea of food uh, being a central focus of the exhibition and that really came to shape a lot of the uh, research and um, the narratives that were represented in the space. Uh, another unique aspect to the curation process is that we worked with many, many, uh, over a hundred uh, community and student contributors. Um, I think from the student side alone, we had, um, I think over 50 students uh, from different institutions, uh, but namely from the Center for Digital Media, 
and also the UBC Instruct program who participated in the development of um, digital media content for the Chinatown location and the Museum of Vancouver location. So just there, uh, through this project, we created internship opportunities for over 50 students um, to you know, be engaged in this process of um, content production. Um, for the Chinatown location, we had the um, very fortunate opportunity to work with closely with Catherine Clement, who is a community curator herself. And she, over the years, uh, has uh, built many wonderful relationships with uh, Chinatown families and many private collectors. And so when you visit the location in Chinatown, you'll see many uh, never seen before photographs that were collected by families and uh, collectors um, that uh, reflect uh, especially the um, period from 50s to 60s and 70s, many beautiful uh, photographs of Chinatown, including neon signs, um, Chinese restaurants, uh, but also social and cultural activities that took place in Chinatown in those years. Um, as well, uh, as I mentioned, there were a lot of uh, artists that were involved, uh, especially uh, in the installation of the MOV location, but also in Chinatown, where we had uh, a pair of young Chinese Canadian artists, uh, Elisa Yan and Sela Zheng, who had um, provided some painted uh, illustrated walks that um, decorate the space as you enter the um, front entrance. And as well in the um, MOV location, we worked with a number of Chinese Canadian artists, Judy Zheng, um, award-winning artist Paul Wong, um, and really were able to um, engage in um, allowing the, the kind of um, dialogue for artists to represent their representations of Chinese Canadian uh, experiences. And one of the also really exciting um, aspects to the uh, MOV location was working with uh, a Squamish Chinese artist, Kito Joseph, who uh, we commissioned a piece of artwork from him um, that really uh, was able to allow us to um, speak to the long history of Chinese and Indigenous relationships. And uh, we also had the opportunity to uh, conduct an oral history uh, interview with him where he shared about his um, Squamish and Toisanese um, Chinese ancestry and sharing memories about his grandmother's cooking. So in many ways, this uh, exhibition is really uh, exciting and brings together voices of many um, different um, um, communities and also individuals. And it's also very multi-generational in that we uh, also engage with a lot of seniors in Chinatown um, who are part of the Yarrow uh, Intergenerational Justice uh, Society who shared as well their uh, experiences of living in Chinatown and some of the challenges that they faced uh, in uh, coming to Canada and uh, speaking to issues regarding food security and also their experiences of just um, seeing and uh, witnessing the changes in Chinatown in recent years. So we're very fortunate that with this exhibition, we're able to uh, bring together voices of not just the earliest waves of Chinese um, immigrants, but also speaking to more recent waves from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, mainland China. And we hope that um, as this project moves along to different locations, um, as well as working together with the Chinese Canadian Museum, that more and more of these narratives can be uh, brought into the awareness of the general public and helping us to really redefine and rethink about what Chinese Canadian history is about. Um, and as mentioned as well, uh, given that this, is, um, this was originally envisioned as a traveling exhibition, um, many of the pieces in the exhibition were designed to be very lightweight and modular and also the content being interchangeable so that they could be adapted to the local content. And we also made use of a lot of interactive displays, um, whether it's low tech or high tech, um, because we really wanted these spaces to um, provide opportunities for visitors to also contribute their own stories, experiences and memories. So um, in the Chinatown location, for instance, we have a huge world map where um, visitors can map their own personal journeys of coming to Canada and what it means, what it meant for them. Um, to travel to uh, from their home country or hometown to come to um, British Columbia. And we also see in uh, many of those stories that people have traveled to multiple places and um, really reflect on the uh, memories and the experiences that they bring from these different places that they've been to. 
And some of the more high tech um, aspects to the exhibition, uh, for instance, we have a story recording booth in the Chinatown location, uh, which allows um, people to share their stories. So we've heard some wonderful stories of um, multi-generational families, the grandchild interviewing their grandfather in front of the story recording booth and recording some of their family memories. So it's really encouraging to see um, how the public has been engaging with different aspects of the exhibitions. Uh, next slide, please. So focusing on the themes at the Museum of Vancouver location, um, below you'll see some photos of the some of the main features of the exhibition. Uh, when you enter at uh, the front entrance, you'll see this neon sign of the Kiefer Bakery, which used to be located in the Chinatown. Um, it started in the 70s and brought in a lot of the uh, Cantonese style uh, baked goods like egg tarts um, to Vancouver. And so it really speaks to that wave of more recent immigrants that brought in food culture to Vancouver. And then the next photo there uh, on, on the second um, image is the installation, one of the installations by artist Paul Wong. Um, that is uh, more reminiscent of the uh, early Chinese Canadian cafes that um, not only were in Chinatown, but also in many small towns throughout British Columbia. Um, third image there is a uh, image of arrival. And uh, it really is uh, sets the tone of the exhibit. Uh, when you enter into the exhibit, the first uh, area that you encounter are images of arrival. So um, these images um, start from very early uh, years in late 19th century, um, where we see a lot of images of uh, Chinese railroad workers and uh, Chinese workers along the Fraser uh, mining for gold. And two more recent uh, experiences like this one here you see, uh, which is dated to the 1960s and uh, you have families reuniting uh, after a long period of exclusion uh, imposed by the um, Chinese Exclusion Act. So, uh, and the fourth image that you see here is from our uh, third section, Wait to be Seated. So um, with the exhibition um, being about um, Chinese Canadian history uh, as one of the core areas, we really wanted a space for um, us to uh, provide visitors uh, a chance to reflect on some of the early um, anti-Chinese legislation, but also um, juxtaposed beside them are some of the uh, more contemporary voices of um, Chinese Canadians who have more recent experiences with racism in their lived experiences. So we were able to have the space um, here for people to really come through and reflect on um, uh, some of the um, early legislation um, against Chinese, but also uh, what you don't see on the side is that there are also some um, newspaper clippings and headlines that reflect as well the activism um, that Chinese Canadian uh, communities had mobilized over the years to fight against injustices. So um, you'll see at the center of that um, fourth image there, there's a photo of Chinese Canadian veterans. And that's a really important aspect to how we understand. And it's a quite a pivotal moment in terms of how um, Chinese Canadians became accepted into um, Canadian society. And also the fight um, that many Chinese Canadians had uh, put forward, even though they weren't recognized as citizens of the country, that they had still uh, selflessly uh, volunteered to serve the country and fight during the war um, in order to uh, fight for the rights of uh, all Chinese Canadians. So um, there are four uh, main sections um, in the exhibition. As you go through, there are uh, various aspects. There are um, photo projections, there are um, artifacts, there are uh, oral history uh, video booths, there are, there's a VR station. So there's many ways for visitors to engage with the different um, multimedia aspects uh, of the space. But then also we wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, a lot of the uh, storylines actually go back to the idea of family and family connections, whether it's uh, your biological family or your chosen family. And so uh, in Chinese Smorgasbord, which is the last section of the exhibition, uh, we have actually uh, a number of displays that speak to aspects of um, intangible culture. Uh, we have a display um, about home cooking um, and family recipes. And we have areas where uh, visitors can explore aspects such as language, uh, such as music, uh, such as uh, festivals, um, so that people can really get a flavor of the vibrancy of the Chinese Canadian community over the years. 
Next slide, please. And then for the Chinatown location, uh, we really wanted to highlight a few um, aspects that uh, tie in with the MOV location. And so we have the four areas, food, services, culture, and activism. And um, for the location in Chinatown, we really have um, some of the key feature pieces, uh, such as the illustrated walk on the top left corner, uh, which was produced by uh, young Chinese Canadian artists um, that shows the image of uh, an intergenerational family having dim sum together. And I think it's quite timely, especially given today is uh, the Lunar New Year and many families are um, celebrating at home uh, with their loved ones. So it's really a, a reminder that many of these stories are, are not just stories of Chinese as victims, but these are also stories about family connections, uh, stories of belonging and stories of building community and having conversation with one another. And then on the... Um, bottom right corner, you have the Sea of Faces installation, which was curated by um, community curator Catherine Clement. And she really um, pulled images from uh, really a wide range of um, different Chinese Canadians. So you see faces of leaders like Juan Alexander Kamyao and Justice Randall Wong and Shirley Chan, who are very well-known community leaders uh, in the community. But you also see faces of younger generations of uh, youth activists there like uh, June and Doris Chow, who are leaders of the uh, Youth Collaborative for Chinatown, which has for a number of years been really uh, working hard towards activating the intangible aspects of heritage and really um, very engaged in many ways in helping to support Chinatown revitalization. So it's really exciting to um, have this space where visitors can come in and they recognize faces and have stories that they share with us as well. Um, and then on the top right hand corner, we have the Paper Shadows installation, which uh, speak to some of the uh, important themes, regional themes um, that are covered in the exhibition. Uh, on, on the right hand side, there's the um, installation regarding the Chinese, Chinese barbecue meats fight that took place in Vancouver's Chinatown, which is juxtaposed against the um, paper shadow cutting of a uh, more contemporary heritage business, the Leloy barbecue meats in Vancouver. And just so thinking about this as well as a space to really think about the importance of keeping both tangible and intangible aspects of heritage alive and important uh, as part of this uh, curating this experience. Uh, and then we also have as well representations from Victoria, Chinatown, as well as Northern BC talking about the long history of Chinese and indigenous relationships uh, up and down the Fraser River. And then on the... Um, bottom left corner, you'll see one of our four uh, multimedia stations. So um, not only are there uh, historical images from different Chinatown communities, but we also have a um, video panel that's integrated into that space. So um, for uh, visitors who come through, um, given with the COVID situation, we installed the um, overhead speakers up on the ceiling um, to minimize the need to uh, touch uh, any pieces of the hardware but then there's also oral histories there um, that really provide uh, not just the visual, but also um, an audio experience of many voices of Chinese Canadians that talking, talking about their experiences with food and identity, um, memories of running family businesses and providing services to the community, um, different aspects of culture, as well as um, thinking about activism um, throughout the years and what activism has meant for different generations of Chinese Canadians. And then the next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we had uh, a number of students involved in helping us to represent the stories about people and places. And uh, all of the content in these exhibitions are uh, presented in three languages, English, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. And this also includes our oral history videos, which are also uh, subtitled in the three languages. So we really, um, through the uh, work of the student teams, uh, were able to bring together both historical and contemporary experiences. And we find that, uh, especially archival records, there's a lot of um, missing voices um, of more contemporary Chinese Canadians. And so using oral history and immersive VR and digital technologies as a method, we were able to uh, really present some of these missing stories and missing experiences uh, in the spaces. And then the next slide. 
Uh, we also used a number of a, a digital storytelling um, techniques and components in the spaces. So not only do we have virtual reality, we have augmented reality story on the top left corner talking about one of the Chinese Canadian uh, First World War veterans, uh, Wee Tan Lui, and about his experience of trying to enlist in the um, arms, armed forces and um, representing as well in the uh, augmented reality experiences, some of the letters that he wrote back home um, as he was um, uh, on duty. And then we also have as well um, 3D scanning display. So some of the artifacts that are part of the MOVs collections, as well as from regional museums um, from Nanaimo and Cumberland and other smaller museums that we were able to have some of these artifacts scanned and um, visitors can use the uh, iPad application to um, look at the details of these artifacts. And then we also had a number of projection technologies that talk about migration experiences, um, both ways between um, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Canada, as well as the, the journeys that people took to multiple places. And finally, we had iPad applications um, that speak to um, intangible aspects of knowledge, such as local food culture in mainland China from different regions, and also um, different regional dialects that are spoken by um, mainland Chinese. So it's really a rich exhibition with a lot of potential for um, further growth and further expansion. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to um, take a few minutes to show a virtual tour of the Chinatown location. And if uh, Nabila can move on to the next slide and try to see if the video will work, that would be wonderful. Anyone able to hear the sound? I can't hear the sound from here. No, I can't hear the sound. It's also quite choppy. Hmm. Maybe we can just uh, point the uh, the URL to people to say in the chat or um, and and maybe take the last 10 minutes instead to kind of uh, to do any, uh, yeah, any questions in, uh, from from folks, uh, uh, Nabila or others, uh, the, the, you know, we can talk a little bit more about anything that uh, needs a little explaining, and uh, and maybe people can go to uh, take that virtual tour uh, on, on their own. Uh, I know it's tough with all the bandwidth problems to uh, to to show a, a, a clip. Yeah, I've just posted the link in the chat, so hopefully. Um, you guys can, will take, can take five minutes to watch it afterwards. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Dennis Fong and Dr. Henry Wu. We really appreciate your